because we have some very special guests that we'll be talking to today. So uh, welcome everyone and, and good morning. Thank you for joining us today on a very special Ask the Historians. Uh, I am Rachel Berlinski. I'm the operations manager of Oak Park River Forest Museum. And today's episode of Ask the Historians will be a little different from our usual format. Um, I will be interviewing two of the Historical Society's most tenured historians and having them share a little bit about how they first got involved with the organization and a couple of uh, some of their most memorable projects over the years. I thought this topic would be appropriate for today, which is known globally as Giving Tuesday, because while most nonprofits like us talk about how important your financial support is, and it truly is, these historians have also given their time very generously, dutifully, and skillfully each serving the Historical Society for more than three decades. So I am honored today to be talking with Jan Novak Dressel and Gary Schwab. And I want to jump right into my questions here. Um, since you see on the screen, we've got pictures of the both of them winning their individual volunteer awards. Um, both of them have been honored by the Illinois Association of Museums for their volunteer service. So you see the pictures on the screen, but we're actually going to be talking to them live and in person. Um, I shouldn't say in person because we are virtual, but um, we are here together in this space. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And um, I want to start off by asking both of you how you first got involved with the Historical Society. And if I may, I'd like to have ladies go first. So um, let me introduce Jan Novak Dressel. Hello there, everyone. Um, I got pulled in, literally pulled in to the Historical Society from, from um, a woman who I met when I first got involved in the Franklin Wright Home and Studio. Um, it was when it was just being purchased and I was the caretaker um, and Elsie Jacobson, um, who it really did so, so much for this community, um, suggested that I come to a meeting. And I thought, oh, this could be very interesting because I love history. But I, I was really busy taking care of the home and studio, shoveling and raking leaves. So I couldn't come at first. But then I gradually, when I had a little bit more time, um, started coming to the meetings. And so she was the person that got me involved. And I think that was the case for a lot of different things with L.C. Jacobson, especially. Yes. And when I said she pulled you in, she had a very, very nice way, a lovely way of twisting your arm and getting you involved. So um, do you um, would you like me to talk about my first project that I worked on or should I leave that for next? Yes, I think I'm going to pause you on that question because I'd like okay. to hear from Gary first about how you got involved with the Historical Society. Let me begin by saying that I grew up in Austin. So I lived in Austin from 1950 to 1976. Then I moved back to the Oak Park area in 78 and bought a house. And in the early 80s, my first wife and I bought this house, which has killed two marriages and a number of other things. But in any event, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an immense ancient E. Roberts house. And we, I became involved in house research, basically, mm -hmm. and started going to meetings and things at the Park District, Lighted Schoolhouse, and things like that. Somewhere in the late 80s, at a meeting, I met Sally Knott, who was the then president of the Historical Society. It might have been a meeting about the future of Pleasant Home. Mm -hmm. That's around the time that they had hired uh, Willard Hasbrook to... Uh, proposed turning it into a conference center by digging out the basement and putting in an elevator. But in any event, as now I had a big mouth and it was suggested that if I wanted to make noises like that, I come to a meeting and I was invited to become a member of the board, which was about 1988, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Well, both of you, um, I should mention too, I don't, I don't know if you, I don't remember if you mentioned this, Jan, but both of you have served on the board of the Historical Society here, um, not in the past couple of years, but for many, many years um, before that. And so that is one way that you both have, have um, shared your service with us too. I also want to say that it's amazing to me that you're both mentioning um, these names that are very, very familiar in the community, um, Elsie Jacobson and Sally Knott and um, Hasbrook even, you know, these, these sort of pillars of, of the community in their own right. So it's nice to hear that you're sort of carrying on some of these legacies of theirs. So I believe I'd like to move on next to my second question. This is our main question for the day too. Um, I asked you both to share a story about uh, a memorable project that you worked on for the Historical Society. So if I can start with Jan, I know you um, have taught in, um, you're a retired teacher that has taught in many of the local schools and uh, you shared that talent with us in many ways over the years. So that is related to the story that you're gonna be sharing with us today. Um, right, um, at one of my meetings, I at one of the historical society meetings, I said, you know, I wish we could get um, more families to come into the museum. And if they don't come in, maybe we could go to them. So I proposed visiting schools and bringing um, objects to the schools. At that time, I was at home with my children. I wasn't teaching. I was on a leave. So um, I, I knew a lot of people that were in the schools. And I said, what I want to do is bring things and not just, you know, hold them up and say, oh, kids, what is this? No, um, they would have to hypothesize, do higher thinking um, on what these objects might have done. Do they have handles? Do they work with electricity? Um, tougher kind of questions. And um, we would go around to schools and that was a wonderful thing. I had more people asking me to go to their um, classrooms than I had time for. Mm -hmm. So I asked um, in the newsletter for a volunteer. Could somebody help me? And uh, I got a phone call from a woman who said she was a retired teacher. And I thought that was great. And so I said, oh, well, um, you know, I could divvy up all the antique tools and you could have a basket and I can have a basket and we could, we could share and then go off to our school programs. And uh, this woman said, oh, I don't drive. And that was my first hint, my very first hint. Then she started talking about being friends with Ernest Hemingway's sister. And I then asked her how old she was. And she told me she was over 90. And so I, um, I, I, I didn't want to be biased. And so I said, great, you're, you're going to come with me. You're going to come with me. We're going to go to schools uh, together and work this out. So she went with me and um, she had never been in a minivan before. And I had to sort of get her up into a minivan help her up. And then when we were in the minivan, she told me this reminded her of when she drove um, ambulances during World War I. So this puts a perspective on this woman. Her name was Buffy Austin. And um, she came on many, many school trips with me. And what made it so special was if I would bring out a button hook 
or if I would bring out some tool that was used a hundred years ago, she would have a personal story about that tool that made it come to life. You know, getting ready for school by buttoning up her shoes, uh, you know, and chasing after the ice man and trying to get chips of ice in July. So that made it wonderful. And um, I, I really enjoyed every, every visit with her because she made it so personal. When we talk about stories, the people who were actually there to tell the story makes it really come alive. So that was my, um, now we had to adapt that when we moved to the new place. So we didn't do school visits as much because people were coming to see us, you know, schools, especially by school was coming, walking right over for field trips. So we made the, the little basket with the antiques, just part of the rotation of what they saw. So that school to school um, initiative kind of goes on and hopefully after COVID it will continue to go on. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you made the connection of, of telling the personal stories because I think that's one of the special things about having a historical society in a community like this is that you you have the chance to capture the stories of, of people that you know, personal stories, the people that actually use these sorts of things, not as artifacts, but as everyday things. Um, and I, 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 yeah. oh, I, I want to just say one other thing that was really funny. When Buffy passed away, her lawyer called me and said, Jan, Buffy has left you something. And it's in my office. Now, I was thinking, hmm, this sounds really dramatic. And what it was, was <laughs> a pig's slop bucket that we used to carry the items around in because the basket wasn't big enough. So even, even as she passed away, she left a joke for me. Uh -huh. So I still have that um, slop bucket. Um, so well, thank you. What a good legacy, an important tool. <laughs> um, speaking of tools, I think um, Jan and Gary are the only two people I can think of that would have a sad iron within arm's reach. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for thank you for showing us that, Jan. You're welcome. And so I want to uh, move on to this question with Gary, because uh, Gary, you have had a long life of, of politics and preservation, um, especially in Oak Park. And I think that is um, one of the stories that you're gonna share with us today is talking about um, something along those lines. So please uh, tell us what memorable project you have in mind. As you know, I'm known for being verbose and not being able to say anything in 10 minutes. So I'm going to try to do this quickly. We're going we're gonna to try to keep you. The, the, the ongoing project has been, I mentioned the house. And we bought this thing and nobody seemed to know anything about it. And going to meetings and talking to people. I discovered that it is an E. Roberts house and it was built in 1897. And I was fortunate in that Mr. Roberts used to run ads in the local papers. So the front page would always have something about Mr. Roberts is building this kind of house for this person. And there were two of those. The problem was that the address has changed and it wasn't obvious to everybody. So this was built as 416 North Oak Park. And in Frances Steiner's thesis on E.E. E. Roberts, she looked at the house that's now at 416 and said, well, that's not what's described. So it took a while to figure out that the house that's now at 316 was the one that was listed as 416. And I, I was lucky. There are very few houses of this vintage that have a whole paragraph or two on the front page of an 1897 paper uh, explaining who the house was built for and what the woodwork was in each room and things like that. 
So that's what I had initially, but this is back from pre-internet days. So that's about as far as I got it. And I was actually working then and I was married and had something more of a life. But over the years, I have done other research on the block. This is in some sense an interesting block because it's the last block that Edgar Rice Burroughs lived on before he went to California. It's the block where Hemingway was born across the street. The second owner of this house, well, the first owner was in the butter, egg, cold storage business in downtown Chicago. Uh, he was 60 when he built the house. He moved to Florida when he was uh, 70, basically. The second owner of the house was the chief engineer for the Union Pacific Railroad. And the president of the Union Pacific Railroad lived right across the street. So these were two guys from Chicago Northwestern who were hired in the 1890s by Ned Harriman to run the Chicago or to run the Union Pacific after he took it over from bankruptcy. Uh, and then the third owner was a broker who killed himself because his business was failing. And in an attempt to cover up, to cover it up, they tried to make it appear to be an accident. And that's another whole long story. But essentially he left his wife with some children and no money. So she started renting out rooms and such. And the house by the thirties was an absentee landlord rooming house with two units on the first floor, five units on the second floor and one unit on the third floor. And when we bought it in 1981, it came with partly that arrangement and a bunch of tenants. And I still have the third floor rented out. I have spent 30 years, 40 years looking for pictures of the house and I found exactly one. It is in a scrapbook that Philander Barclay collected. And the picture is from a village directory. It's not one of his pictures. It's a half tone printed picture. And no one seems to actually know what the publication was, but it has names and addresses printed on the back. And in his collection, there's at least one other picture from the same book that's been cut up. And that picture shows an 1870s house on the north side. So it was my assumption that, and there was one article saying that the first owner had the old house moved off. Mm -hmm. So looking at that picture, I assumed that, well, they just shifted. Something that most people don't understand is that Oak Park was settled right after the Chicago fire. It was people moving away from the fire in 1871, 1872, and they were moving away from poor people and lots of other things. James Scoville, Scoville Park, et cetera, subdivided this area. He bought the property from the Kettle Strings and you had to buy two quarter acre lots. The idea was that nobody would be dumb enough to, Nobody would be dumb enough to build a house in the middle of both lots because then they couldn't sell it later. So your fire protection, you were moving from Chicago that had some paved streets and water mains and a real fire department to a place where you had a volunteer fire department, unpaved streets, no water mains. And you would build this house that was 50 feet high and made out of wood and had a wood roof and occasionally threw out cinders from coal burning. So your fire protection was you had 50 feet between you and the next house. So all of the houses along here had 100 foot lots. After water mains went in, after pavement went in, it became feasible to fill in. So the house originally on this lot was moved somewhere and this house was built in 1897. My coach house is a year after the Chicago fire and it's from the original house and it's on the 1873 bird's eye view of Oak Park. Mm -hmm. um, and that was always what I thought. The, I know that the house to the north had been moved there and had been remodeled by E.E. E. Roberts around 1900 and was the parsonage for First United Methodist Church until the 1950s. Recently, Frank found a uh, reference to a house on North Fair Oaks that claims to have been moved from somewhere around here and is the right age. And with the pandemic, I haven't gone down and actually looked at the title records to see how long that's been there. That, that doesn't resolve things, but it leaves open the issue of, was the house on this lot moved one lot north or was it moved several blocks away? And a lot of the houses that were here originally were moved over to the Ridgeland area. Mm -hmm. And you imagine, the, and you have to think about this. 
you had people raising these houses with manual labor, putting them on wheels and pulling them with mules or horses over mud. So labor was cheap in those days. And there were no railroad tracks and no uh, electrical wires in the way. So I have found a fair amount of research on this. And in doing that, I have learned to research other houses and that, which I occasionally do for my amusement. I, I, I had probably taken too much time already. No, well, this is exactly the point that I want to make um, is you, you sort of got very involved initially because of the research that you were doing on your own house. And um, through, first of all, just through many years of, of that project alone and um, the, the sort of tools that you've gained because of that research, you have become such a, a profound researcher for us. Um, in, in so many different projects, we, we go to you to look for specific details on things, but also um, it's just incredible to think how different research has become from the time you started looking at your own house to today, because as you said, it's constant because of um, changing technologies, constantly finding different resources. There's always something more to do. There's, the project is never done. Well, the other thing too is that in most of these projects, I find that you can do a lot of stuff online. You can find sort of gross facts about things, but you always get back to a point where, okay, I really need to look at the original documents if there are any. And as people probably know, building records from Oak Park before 1902 don't exist in detail because the village wasn't formally founded until 1902. So you end up looking at newspaper articles and what have you. And for another project, I ended up looking at all the building records I could find in Oak Park between about 1895 and 1899. So I went to obviously to the Historical Society, to the Oak Park Library, to the uh, Washington Library downtown, to the Chicago History Museum, to the Ryerson Library at the Art Institute and looked at all of these old magazines and what have you. And it ends up being really just sort of random. If the architect felt he was gonna publicize himself by featuring that house and putting an article in a magazine or something like that, then you can find some reference to it. Otherwise you have these gossip items mm -hmm. from old newspapers saying so-and-so moved from here and they're having a wedding party and things like this. And the addresses have changed and the names of the towns have changed. And one little detail I will throw in, the building permits from Cicero Township no longer exist. I was researching a house at 229 North Ridgeland today. One of the Oak Park papers every quarter printed a summary of all the building permits issued in Cicero Township. Mm -hmm. By legal description, mind you, not by address. So I found this little listing of all the building permits and it says how big the footprint of the house is, who the person was taking out the permit and how much they said the house was going to cost. The house I was researching was on the same little tiny article as my house. Mm -hmm. And in those days, everybody lied because your initial tax was based on how much you said the house cost. So my house and that house supposedly cost the same. And having been in both houses, I know that the other people lied more than my people. <laughs> because that house costs probably at least twice as much as mine in the day. Mm -hmm. Well, I should, I should pause okay. you on this story, because like I said, um, your research on the, the property on Ridgeland could be a whole nother topic for, for discussion. So the only reason I, I brought it up is it was, I really tried to do everything dance. I could see about, excuse me, old park houses in that period. I'm getting over a cold, I'm sorry. Well, thank you for, thank you for um, sticking it out for us because this has been an incredible sort of sampling of the types of things that we've gotten you both involved with. So- um, And look at the background of my picture. You can tell that I, I try to be anachronistic. 
<laughs> so I'm going to pause you both here and um, I will invite anybody to ask, ask us some questions. If you have questions for Jan or Gary or um, things, things as such. And as I'm inviting you to do that, I'm going to see if I can share my screen again here because I have one more little plug for us today. So today being Giving Tuesday, I'd like to um, just say a word about um, how grateful I am for the opportunity to, to speak with you both here today in this capacity. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing these free programs in 2022 and uh, planning out all sorts of other exciting things for the year to come. Um, but we can't do that without your support. So uh, if you are feeling generous today and willing to um, make a contribution to us, then you can see our website on the screen and um, I invite you to please visit our website to make a donation today or just see what other things we have coming up that might be of interest to you. Uh, you can also contact me by the email that you see on your screen or the phone number here at the museum. And, um, and again, also just share your ideas. If you are hoping that we talk about a topic in particular on one of these shows, or you'd really like to see a program, a certain type of something or other at the museum in the coming year, please let us know. We are always happy to take ideas. And um, I think I want to check the chat here. And again, thank our speakers for today, Gary and Jan. It is an honor to be able to document some of your stories and uh, talk with you here. So um, I have some feedback here that says, uh, I love that you hold Zoom meetings. Living as far away as I do now, Zooming gives me a chance to attend the museum's programs. And uh, I want to thank you, Joan, very much for saying that comment, because that's really been a game changer for us uh, starting in 2020 and throughout this year, 2021. Um, it's been so nice to be able to reach out to people um, in the surrounding communities and also, you know, people who have lived in Oak Park or River Forest and moved very far away and all these sorts of situations where we wouldn't normally get the chance to see and interact with a lot of our um, members and donors um, to be able to share content and have people visit us, visit us from all over has been really a joy. So we hope to continue doing that. Um, we hope to continue doing that. We're looking forward to continuing that uh, in 2022. So, so again, thank you for your comment and uh, thank you both for your uh, presentations today. So I think with that, I will end today's program and uh, look forward to seeing you all again next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>